And Mr. Keystrop, founder of Normal, I want to welcome you back to the show again. This Thank is you. The second time World's along. oldest marijuana smoker. Yeah. And we were just talking earlier that just last year, during the Boston Freedom Festival, you were had your first U.S. marijuana arrest. Yeah, amazing, because I've been <laughs> smoking out front for, uh, we found a normal 37 years ago, and I think I wasn't as out front the first four or five years, but I went back recently because I'm working on a book. I went back and was surprised at how honest about my own drug use I was in 1977. So right. somewhere back there, I came out front. For some reason, they didn't bust me until last year at the at the Boston Freedom Rally, and right. I think it was strictly an accident. I mean, we, uh, I was smoking a joint behind a booth with the associate uh, produ uh, associate director at High Times, Rick mm -hmm. Cusick, and uh, we weren't trying to get arrested. I, we, otherwise, I would have lit up a joint on the stage. We were just sharing a joint. Mm -hmm. So uh, once they arrested us, they kept trying to drop charges, and of course, we didn't want them to drop charges. <laughs> and, uh, th three different times they offered. Finally. The judge said, if we'll just pay the court costs, and our lawyer objected, said, no, we don't want to drop charges. He said, well, I'll waive the court costs, and our lawyer objected. <laughs> <laughs> and so, at any event, the judge finally figured out, he said, ah, nullification. You know, we wanted, so we ended up going to trial. We both took the stand under oath and said, of course we were smoking a joint. What else would you be doing at the Boston Freedom Rally? It's a smoking, right, for Christ's right. sake. <laughs> You know, it's why I mean, the only time once a year I go to Boston is to mm -hmm. attend a, the smoke out. And at any event, uh, they ended up convicting us. The people in the jury pool who were favorable were too honest. One of them even said to the judge, Judge, if they lit up a joint on the stand, I wouldn't convict them. <laughs> so, so all of the good people got taken out of the jury pool, sure. and the others didn't have much trouble. But to the judge's credit, he understood it was an intellectual challenge. He had no court costs, no fine, no probation. The, the prosecutor went six months probation because they knew they'd put us on drug testing and we'd fail, you know. But uh, the judge said, no, 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 time served. We, uh, we served 20 minutes when they arrested us. 20 so, minutes time So it was, I thought it was, we didn't get penalized for going to trial. Most people in America do. Right. If you assert Tell your me. rights and go to trial as any... Tell me. No. Right. You pay a penalty. Well, you know, so, I went through a, a federal trial for growing marijuana back in, what was it, 93, December of 93. And I was told if I didn't take the plea bargain offer, I was going to get 10 years. So I, they offered me five years. And that didn't really seem like much of a bargain. So I did go to trial, and I admitted I did everything that the judge and, the, you know, that the prosecutor was alleging. We didn't even call any witnesses. We did have one point where they introduced my library that turned out to be pretty beneficial to me because when my uh, defense attorney was able to cross-examine the officer on the stand he said pick up this book marijuana your legal rights turn to page 219 and read the chapter headline the cop picked it up he stuttered for about uh, 30 40 seconds the judge said read the chapter headline the uh, my lawyer said read the chapter headline he just kept stuttering Finally, it came out, it said juries can acquit defendants even if they think they're guilty. And it was about six pages all about jury nullification. The prosecutor jumped up, objection, objection. And the judge says, oh, you can't object to your own evidence. You can only object <laughs> to their evidence. Now, you introduced this evidence, so you can't object to it. And it was kept in the record, and I was acquitted. So well, you, I would have done 10 years, and I don't really know of any other... You're a man to win on nullification. I know. Until... Until about 1880 in this country, uh, mm -hmm. defense lawyers could argue right. jury nullification. They could right. say to the jury, look, if you think the defendant did his charge, but that it would not be fair to convict him of a crime, which would be a marijuana smoker, obviously. Most Americans know it shouldn't be a crime. Um, but you can't argue that because of a Supreme Court decision, I think it was in 1880. And so now what has to happen, you have to figure out ways to try to let the jury know that if they're outraged, by this particular application of the law, they do not have to convict. Most of them right. think they do. Yeah, we just, they don't let them tell the jury, unfortunately. That's right. No, and I got lucky <laughs> in the books. So the, you didn't get so lucky, Eddie. You, well, what, no, actually. Uh, have you been sentenced yet? No, I get uh, sentenced December 21st. Now, and this in federal court? Yes, and to address what you said about having the courage to stand by your convictions and take it clear to trial. Uh, two and a half years ago, when they had all four 
uh, the major components of the two warrants. Uh, I was looking at four life sentences, $17 million in fines, and an additional 40 years uh, prior to the UDV decision, which is a major religious decision. Uh, they offered me 30 months, 18 months in prison, and six months in a halfway house, six months at uh, home, home detention. Uh, I go back to the very real possibility on December 1st of being sentenced to prison for the rest of my natural life. Mm -hmm. uh, they're asking for a 10-year minimum at this time, which of course at this point in my life is it's the almost equivalent. a life sentence. It is yeah. a life sentence. Uh, what useful life I have left uh, as far as being a productive How old member. Are you now? Well, I'm 56 now. Mm -hmm. And uh, you I don't still mean, got some life after well, you. I'm, don't I'm, 66, I'm, don't you? Well, yes, yeah. but the, but the point I'm making <laughs> is, is is if I take 10 years out of my life right now, oh, I understand. Spend in prison when I come out at 66. What good am I going to be to myself or anybody else? Certainly, mm -hmm. I'll still be able to do. You know, I'm not going to just die. But mm -hmm. the other side of it is, I might as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's no, sad. there's a lot to keep fighting for. Well, the judge uh, was emphatic uh, after she. Uh, abolished me for smoking, growing, or being around any marijuana. She then let me come up here. And one of the points she was emphatic about was that I let people know the dangers of growing marijuana and the penalties. And I will tell you quite frankly, if you grow marijuana and the federal government catches you, you cannot have enough money, you cannot have enough power, you cannot have enough friends. They will destroy you. My attorneys won this case three times. The first time, all of the warrants were thrown out. The judge said, do not put your lying witnesses to the prosecution on my stand about open field. Less than a month later, she turned around and allowed the open field warrant, keeping the case going. The second time, we did a flawless presentation under the uh, Religious Freedoms Restoration Act. For the first five minutes, the judge came out, agreed with every point we made, said that I was sincere, that this was religious conviction. We made every point that the Supreme Court called for. She said that we qualified for. She then spent the next five minutes telling the prosecutor that he had failed on every count. He had not shown compelling interest. He had not shown least restrictive means. According to the Udiva decision, at that time, that case was over. I won. The prosecutor submitted. My attorney submitted. At that time, as far as I know, and I'm not positive, maybe you know better, but as far as I know, at that time, the judge is supposed to take everything under consideration. Instead, this judge took it on herself to become the prosecutor, explained that diversion was possible, even though the UDV decision said the diversion in and of itself is possible at any level and therefore cannot be used as a sole compelling reason for a decision. She used it for the sole compelling decision, holding, holding me over again in trial when I should have won the case. And when we actually went to trial, she tailored her jury instructions so specifically and defined the crime so specifically that a gentleman that spoke to the jury after the fact told me that one of the ladies that he spoke to told him with tears running down her face that they knew I had broken no law, either state or federal, mm -hmm. but that because of the judge's specific jury instructions and the specific definitions that they were given, they had no choice but to find me guilty. And sadly, in my jury pool, as you alluded to, the guys that stood up and said, hey, my mother died of marijuana or died of cancer and used marijuana the last two years. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing that brought her relief. You're out of here. Let me ask you something, Keith. Is there any way to kind of exclude those kind of questions from the jury? Say, we're not going to ask them about their marijuana use, and you can't either. Uh, I think a lot of defense lawyers, in fact, don't. Well, first off, in states, the judge usually does it, not the defense lawyer. But in right. federal court, the defense lawyers get to do it. But what I hear is some of the more experienced ones will frequently waive their right to ask questions for the very point you raise. They, they sometimes think by the dress and the way a juror acts, 
that they can kind of guess who's sympathetic, and if they ask the damn question and the juror answers it honestly, uh, they're thrown out of the pool. So well, you, right. a lot of lawyers think they'd rather rely on their own instincts than ask the questions. They, yeah, they threw. That makes sense. I'm not sure how many people, but at least six to eight people out of the the jury pool when they came in with 80 people, uh, nurses. Yeah. They threw them out? Threw them out. Doctors wow. threw them out. Anybody that had, had any, any medical knowledge, medical knowledge got thrown out immediately. Right. In my case, they were pre-screened before they ever came to the courtroom. Right.